Amen. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. Happy Resurrection Day. Amen. I uh, typically wouldn't do a holiday message, an Easter message, Christmas message. We also faithfully show up when we're working through the Bible. I would just keep on working, but it just so happened that we ended First Peter, and now we're in between books. So I said, like, okay, Lord, I'm, I wanted to just start in Second Peter and just push on, but felt my hand was forced a little bit, so we're going we're gonna to do an Easter message. Today we'll be in First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 6. The Greeks at this time, they didn't really believe in the resurrection. And the culture of the day made its way into the church and caused some of the church to question it. So the Apostle Paul reasons with them. First Corinthians chapter 15, let's read verses 1 through 6. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached, which you also received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Let's pray. Father, what wonderful, wonderful text you put before us today. Please give us ears to hear, hearts to understand. Please make soft, fertile ground of our hearts and plant your word so we don't soon forget it and change us more to the image of your son, Lord. Please lead us by your spirit. We need him now. Please be glorified, lead us, we pray it all in your son's name, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. According to the scriptures, it's important words, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And when it's said that Scripture is God-breathed, while you're speaking, you're breathing out. And as you continue to speak and speak more and more sentences and you breathe out, there's going to come a time where you have to stop and take a breath so you can keep speaking. Scripture is the very breath of God. God breathed out and He spoke the Word. God expired the scriptures and inspired man with the scriptures. All of mankind proclaim salvation. Different religions, different codes of moral conduct. Just be a good person. There's no heaven or, or hell. God wouldn't send anyone to hell. There's, there's all kinds of salvation to be had according to man. But there is one salvation according to God, and it's according to Scripture. Let's read verses 1 and 2 together. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. There's an order of succession here. 
the gospel is made known by preaching. And the gospel is simply meaning good tidings, good news, the, the good news of salvation. But when it's referenced, it's always singular. It is the gospel. Galatians 1.6 I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Every alternative view to the gospel according to scriptures is a distortion of the gospel. There's only one. So whenever an alternative means of salvation, they're contrived, it first stems from the reality that man needs to be saved. They conclude that from the gospel. The understanding comes from the one true gospel according to scriptures. And everything else is a distortion. Even to proclaim there's no heaven or no hell is still a distortion of the gospel. It's me saying this, this computer doesn't exist. Declaring the absence of something is still a distortion of the reality of something. It's still distorting the gospel to say it doesn't exist. The reality is, there's one, and it's according to the God-breathed scripture. Now back to our succession. The gospel, or the good news of salvation, is preached. It is then received. The Greek word is paralambano. It means to take with oneself, to join to oneself, an associate or companion, I like this one, to accept or acknowledge one to be such as he professes to be. It's received and accepted with obedience. So the gospel isn't merely a message, it's a mandate that man must obey. Next in the succession, In which you stand. To stand firm in the presence of others. If if your faith is real, it can be tested and it can withstand testing. It's preached, it's received, in it you stand. And let's look at verse 2. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, Unless you believed in vain. You're saved if you hold fast to it. You don't move away from the gospel. The Apostle Paul told the Galatian church about the other gospels in chapter 2. He said, But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. How, How little tolerance... The Apostle Paul had for trash, for anything other than the gospel. He he didn't entertain it, and he tells us, don't entertain it. 2 John 1, verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. Amazing. Don't receive them into your house. How prophetic that 2,000 years ago, Scripture would declare that Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons would show up on your doorstep with another gospel. Don't entertain them. Don't even greet them. Say, you have another gospel. Leave. That's how much tolerance you should have for it. Paul said, this truth, the gospel, will save you, but only if you receive it, And you hold on to it. You don't leave it and you don't move away from it. What good is salvation if you walk away from it? A race that you don't finish. You must finish the race. Hold fast. Otherwise, it says, unless you believed in vain. It means without purpose and without success. Now, let's look at the gospel according to Scripture that we hold fast to and that will save us. It's verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, 
that Christ died for us according to the Scriptures. A few things are important here pertaining to that sacrifice made for our sins. One, that the sacrifice was actually for our sins. Two, that the sacrifice actually died. And three, that it was according to the Scriptures. I'm going to reference a lot of Scripture today. We'll be in Psalm 22 for now. You can try to flip around, or if you want to just listen, that's fine too. Psalm 22, this is what's called a a messianic psalm. It was a psalm about the coming Messiah. In verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The very words Jesus cried out on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verses 7 and 8 of that. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Do you remember what? They said to Jesus how they mocked him when he was on the cross. They heard him. They said, oh, listen, he's calling out for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah will save him. Verses 16 and 18. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You can read that verse to a non-believer and they will tell you, That scripture is about Jesus being crucified. It's prophecy written a thousand years before Jesus was even born and 500 years before crucifixion was even invented. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. None of his bones were broken. Psalm 34 and the Gospel of John declare this, that he was already dead. The Roman soldiers walk up to him, and and they would have broken his legs as the custom of, of the regular Roman crucifixion, but they didn't because they were surprised he was already dead. People didn't usually die as quickly as Jesus from Roman crucifixion, but he was crucified with a certain brutality that was beyond the typical custom that the the honest thieves next to him were crucified by. It was more severe. He was dead because he was flogged into oblivion to the point he couldn't even carry his cross. Remember, Simon of Cyrene had to help carry his cross for him. And of course, he had a Roman broad spear into his side. He was up, so it was probably up and under. And it was a Roman broad spear, so it probably impaled every organ that you can think of. He didn't pass out and wake up later, come out of a coma. He died. Alan Chapman said this. Had there been a modern state-of-the-art accident and emergency unit at the foot of the cross, with resuscitators, drips, blood transfusions, a top-class surgical team, and the whole panoply of modern medicine poised to spring into action the moment Jesus was cut down, they would have found their task hopeless. And the wisest, most skillful, and most learned medical team in the world could only have said to Mary Magdalene, Sorry, the damage is too great. Jesus the man is dead. End quote. Have you ever wondered why Thomas doubted? Because it was beyond a doubt that Jesus was dead. Never for a second did he consider he was alive. Because he was certain of his death. Verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. We read this in, in Matthew 27. They did this for Jesus' clothes. Now, let's move on to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely our griefs 
he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Pilate, who sentenced Jesus, even declared that he found no guilt in him, that he was an innocent man. He was truly pierced through for our transgressions, not his own. Our iniquity, our sin fell upon him, an innocent man. Verse 9 of Isaiah 53. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Matthew 27 tells us that a rich man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate for the body of Jesus, and he wrapped them in white linen. In Psalm 45, 8, all your garments are fragrant with myrrh, aloes, and cassia. They piled a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe and dried plants on Jesus' body, and then they laid him in a rich man's tomb. A tomb that was given to him on loan, praise the Lord. It was just a rental. It's clear that Jesus died for our sins. He died for our sins according to scriptures and that he was buried according to scriptures. And there are so many more scriptures that we could spend Sundays going over Old Testament fulfillment of how Jesus died within the Psalms, within Daniel, within Genesis. And it's there and it is rich. Jesus said in John 5, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. The whole Bible finds its fulfillment in Jesus. That's why he's the word made flesh. It's all about him. The last part of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3 is what our entire faith hinges upon. And that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. Any man can claim that he's dying for the sins of the world. But there's one important difference between that man and Jesus. His tomb's not empty. Go to Israel, there's an empty tomb. Hallelujah. Verse 17 of this chapter tells us, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, your faith is worthless because you're still in your sins. His tomb is empty. He did rise from the dead. Atheists and skeptics have for years and years attempted to disprove or at minimum just implant doubt in the rising of Jesus. There's the swoon theory that claims that he he never died, but he simply passed out on the cross and then he woke up later in the tomb. So when he woke up, he unraveled himself. He removed the hundred pounds of spices with his, his hands and his feet ripped open. They weren't, they weren't clean holes like the Catholic Church shows you the stigmatas of Jesus. They were probably lines from where they went in, whether it's here or here, and his weight just sort of ripped them open. His back ripped open from the floggings. And his entire torso impaled by that Roman broad spear. No food or water for days. In critical condition, he rolled that heavy stone out of the way. And then he bum rushes a Roman guard. Sure he did. Add that one to the list of miracles that he performed because it didn't happen. Not, Not for a healthy man, much less a dead one. Which brings us 
to the matter of Jesus' tomb and how secure was it? It's a big question. First, the stone. It was a large stone placed in the, in the mouth of the tomb. And it wasn't particularly easy for someone just to come in and out of. It's not a door on a hinge. And second, upon this, this tomb was placed a Roman seal. And the seal was a sign of authentication that the tomb was occupied. And that the, entire, the power and authority of Rome stood behind this seal. And anyone found breaking the seal, it would have resulted in a very unpleasant death. Thirdly, the Roman guard. This is a quote from Don Stewart. The Roman guard was a 16-man unit that was governed by very strict rules. Each member was responsible for six square feet of space, The guard members could not sit down or lean against anything while they were on duty. If a guard member fell asleep, he was beaten and burned. But not only was he the one executed, the entire 16-man guard unit was executed if only one member fell asleep while he was on duty. End quote. They ran a tight ship. And that's what makes this next theory comical. The disciples stole the body. Okay, we just learned about the Roman guard. The disciples, SEAL Team 6, the Roman guard. Butch goes back in time and he trains them. We're rewriting history, let's just rewrite it. Butch goes back in time, he trains them in hand-to-hand combat and how to perform this covert mission. Okay, fine. The real problem lies with there's absolutely no motive for them to do this. Consider the history of the disciples before and after Jesus was crucified. This expedition would have been headed up by Peter, right? Their unelected spokesperson. But Luke's account of the gospel clearly tells us of Peter's unwillingness to risk his life for the sake of Jesus while Jesus was alive. When he was arrested, you can read Peter was following at a distance safely. And when, good time for water, Peter was questioned, he said, I don't know him. I don't know Jesus. Questioned again and again the third time, he said, he started cursing and swearing, I do not know him. You all remember, and then Jesus looks across the courtyard. And he he walked away and he, he left and he wept bitterly. But now, after Jesus was publicly, brutally crucified and killed, Peter's encouraged by this, apparently. And he gets a second wind, and he rallies the troops, he gets all the disciples together, and he says, let's steal the body. And we'll tell everyone that Jesus rose from the dead. Great. (laughs) It's impossible, but also, why? Why would they do this? It's such a lazy theory that completely disregards all of natural human behavior, self-preservation, but more specifically, the, the historical recorded behavior of the disciples. Before the crucifixion, their unwillingness to risk their lives. After the crucifixion, after Jesus rose from the dead, the willingness of the disciples to risk their lives. Why wouldn't they risk their lives when their leader was alive? The one who had power, who could perform miracles, that's when they should have risked their lives, but they didn't. People don't create lies and scams without selfish motives. The disciples did not go on to live luxurious, wealthy lives full of fortune. They went on to live the rest of their days in persecution and suffering, and poverty. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says, For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all, as men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. 
We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless and we toil and we work with our hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. Let's risk our lives, steal Jesus' body, so this can be our future. And then after we suffer the rest of our lives, we can be horribly murdered. Thrown off of buildings, stoned, beheaded, fed to lions. People don't live like this. People don't die like this for a lie. All circumstantial evidence points to the true resurrection. Now, moving away from circumstantial evidence, we can look at testimonial evidence. According to Jewish law, on the basis of two or three witnesses, judgment could be concluded, even pronouncing a death sentence, that on the basis of testimony, something could be declared as fact. Let's continue with verse 5 of 1 Corinthians. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. These are eyewitness accounts. They can't be taken lightly or discredited or devalued because these are people almost 2,000 years ago. They didn't have the internet, so their testimony is less valuable than ours today. That's nonsense. They're people. They're, They're humans just as us. Today, if if we were to go tell a police officer that we saw a murder be compi- committed, he doesn't say, nah, your testimony doesn't prove anything, doesn't mean anything. Of course not. There's merit and there's weight to a testimony. He would investigate. Now, if 12 people ran up to an officer and said, we saw a murder be committed, the entire town would shut down and a manhunt would be on. There would be so much weight to those testimonies. Let's read verse 6. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Over 500 That's more than we can fit in this building. That's more than than some town's populations. That's more than than Nazareth, than than Jesus' hometown where he grew up. How many people would have populated that town at the time? But still, there were millions of people at this time. Why didn't he show himself to the entire world? He is, before he ascended into heaven? That's a question that I think people have wondered. Notice that Jesus didn't show himself to just anybody, to everybody. Look at the verse. That he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. He revealed himself to the faithful. He didn't show himself to non-believers The same way that he spoke in parables. The same way he says, don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give the children's bread to the little dogs. Jesus is the perfect steward. He never wasted anything. His his time, his words, or his appearance. He showed himself to the brethren and the brethren alone. But... But, but if, if Jesus showed himself to more people, more people would believe. You hear that all the time, why people don't believe in the Lord. They just want a sign. 
In Luke 16, there's a parable of, of the poor man, Lazarus, who went to heaven, and a rich man who went to hell. And the rich man in hell said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, that you send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. We can sometimes kick ourselves when we want to reach a a lost loved one thinking, if only I said this, or if I showed them this, or if I did that, it's something I'm not doing, that's why they won't believe. I could do more. Jesus didn't bother to show himself to some people after he was raised from the dead. Some people will never believe Jesus knew who those people were. We don't. So we try to persuade all men. We don't know who will come to Christ, what sons of God will or will not be revealed. Atheists, skeptics, we go after all of them. Ah, you believe in Jesus? That fairy tale? They think you're you're stupid and you're lacking intellect. You persuade them. Compel them. What's so hard to believe? Jesus is God. Why couldn't he save the world, be raised from the dead, and then present them with the case? Because it happened. It's true. There's truth on your side. We We have truckloads of empirical evidence, of observational facts. The Christian's faith isn't baseless. It's not a blind faith. It's reasonable Science isn't against the gospel. Science supports it. But know this, providing enough empirical evidence to someone that's a, to support the resurrection is not the basis for our faith. It's an agent of witnessing. Our faith doesn't rest in the evidence. Salvation rests in the belief in the gospel, not the evidence. Jesus Christ was the greatest evidence of all. And people still did not believe him. We today, we've never seen Jesus and we do believe without the greatest evidence of all. Evidence is not the basis for faith, but it's a tool for presenting the gospel. Similarly, our testimony is not the gospel but we can use our testimony as a tool for presenting the gospel. Which is why Paul said, speaking of those 500 brethren, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Why would he tell his readers that many of them are still alive? He was saying, they're still alive. Go ask them. You can go ask them for yourself. Go, if it helps you. Go ask them. They'll tell you. They'll testify that Jesus is risen. Testimony can help lead someone to believe. But a person's faith cannot rest in someone else's testimony. In John chapter 4, there's a story of of a woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. and, And Jesus tells her all about her life. What she did, who she's, who she's been with, who she's with now, her husbands. And after her encounter with Jesus, she concludes he's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so she runs into town and she tells everyone, testifying, come and see a man who told me all the things that I've done and it's the Christ. Many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. But, 
after Jesus stayed in that town with them for two days, this is what it says. This is what they said. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Have you received Jesus for yourself? Do you know him for yourself? Faith can't rest on someone else's testimony. You have to have your own. Jesus won't save you because he's your parents' Lord. He has to be your Lord. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If you don't follow him, and you don't know his voice, then the Bible says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It's still today. Call on him. But if you don't, if you don't do it now, your heart may never be tender enough to receive him again. If Doug would come up, and men, you can get ready to hand out communion. The world would love to let us think that we can be neutral. That I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not against God. You know? He said, if you're not for me, you're against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Not accepting him is rejecting him. It has a consequence. Your heart just gets hard. So as the music is played, if you realize Jesus isn't your Lord, or you thought he was, and you realize he's not, and you want him to be, and your heart and your mind repent, turn away from sin, and just say, all right, decide I'm going to follow Jesus. I've heard your voice and I'm going to follow it. And Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. It was for me. It is for everyone else. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Go ahead, men. Oh, 
hold of me above all we only have the resurrection of Jesus because we were first given the death of Jesus. He told the church, remember my death. It's interesting. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus took the bread and the wine. He said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. You all eat the bread and drink the cup with me. As often as you eat the bread, you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Remember his death. Celebrate it. It's our atonement. Then walk in the power of his resurrection. Amen? We all stand. Father, thank you for every soul that you brought here today. And thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for raising your son to testify that the sacrifice was accepted. We love you. We worship you. We praise you. Father, please bless everyone here for coming with tender hearts for you, and strength. Help us to worship you with our lives and proclaim the power of your Son. Hallelujah. We praise you, we love you, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad goodbye.